distinctiveness of the way you put it together is just masterful. Um, I don't know what more I could really say about it other than people really need to check it out. Um, I know many people really, really love your work, so I don't think it would be a stretch to try to convince anyone, but, you know, if you need convincing, you know, let this be it, you know, go, <laughs> go check this out. It's amazing. Amazing. What you've done, um, I think in a, in a lot of ways elevates the, um, the book art in, in, into like a, a form beyond what it might have been previously. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, you, now, as a result of the completion of the cycle, you now you've embarked on a trip to the United States. Um, and thankfully, you stopped in Salem and uh, gave us a little taste of your work, um, which was, was excellent. Um, I thought you, there was a great turnout for the presentation, and everybody I talked to was really enjoyed it and was very impressed. So um, I'm curious how... It was for you to like present this publicly um, because I know from my own experience it's like very different like presenting written work sort of uh, you know in a disembodied form you know you just put it out there to the public versus showing up and actually presenting it in a much more intimate setting. Yeah, I really enjoyed doing that kind of presentation because I'm um, very much a multimedia and, you know, I'm a performer as well as a, a visual artist and a, a writer, so um, I like sort of bringing all those things together, uh, especially recently where I can, like, um, have the actual books there so people can see how they're interconnected and then having the video projections of uh, the book so people can see them in more detail but also then having some of the uh, imagery from the book animated and morphing into each other so you can see the connections um, even more um, which gives me an opportunity to also present uh, video work that I've been doing lately and then um, yeah, also throwing some light music so it's uh, another, another aspect of the uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a really all-encompassing sort of media presentation. You know, the live music, the video, seeing the books, seeing the imagery from your books, hearing you talk about it. Um, some of the things that really caught my attention, though, were the, uh, the inclusion of, in the video of the, uh, the alchemical chess and the ritual I don't know if it's theater or I just want to say ritual sort of drama, I mm -hmm. guess was, I think that was very, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, glad, it was you I'm glad you mentioned the alchemical chess because that's a, a more recent kind of thing that sort of spun off from the last book in a way and has become a thing unto itself. And, um, yeah, this tour of the U.S. isn't really just about um, um, doing, like showing how the telequadrivium fits together. Because the, the last book did come out last year, so I sort of did most of my presentations with that in Europe and Australia. But um, I haven't been in the States for four years, and, um, yeah, decided it was uh, high time to return so I'm, I haven't really done presentations of that nature about how the series fits together here before, so uh, the one in New York will also involve that, but uh, most of the other shows I'm doing here are more on just music and theatre-based, um, we can't as much talking. Um, but yeah, the uh, chemical chess is sort of the main aspect of what I'm doing on this tour because that's like a, a video music video clip I recently finished that I sort of use as backing for a live performance. And it's 
it's working with an actual physical alchemical chess set that I use live in the performance as well. As well. Uh, and uh, the figures from that are top animated in the video as well. But the, um, the alchemical chess set was, was a um, something that uh, sprang off from the final volume in the Telequadrium just to ratiate because I, I'd never really thought about making a, um alchemical set except I did some um, two-dimensional images that included uh, chess piece imagery with our chemical symbolism for uh, distillation yeah, for the white book. Um, so I realized how sort of how chemically symbolic uh, chess is in terms of having a, you know, a white queen and a red king. Um, and yeah, I, I started thinking about what one or the other pieces could relate to um, in terms of uh, our, our chemical and esoteric symbology. And, um, yeah, I just put a few pieces in some um, semi-digital artworks that I did for the colour book. And somebody emailed me and said, hey, can you actually make a chess set like this for me? <laughs> um, so then the pictures became an actual thing. Um, so yeah, I'm um, I'm grateful to that person, Zach Magus, um, for um, seeding this whole uh, new sort of uh, direction because it's been now become a performance and everything as well. Because I'd also written some poetry related to the alchemical chess figures for the book, and that developed into a song uh, while the chess set itself was becoming three dimensional for this for what originally started out as a commission. And so that all sort of um, linked back um, linked back up and now I'm doing performing with the physical chess set and um, you know, while playing the song that has the lyrics that were originally the poetry to go with the pictures in the book. Um, so it's a great example of how aspects of the telequadrivium are um, manifesting in more and more and more into the physical world. Um, I guess when you work creatively so intensively with something for so long, you know, it's like a nine year project and um, it seems like you know now it's um come there's aspects of it that are coming more into the world and you know, becoming more um, you know, three dimensional and kinetic and you know, in surprising ways that weren't um, you know, directly intended or expected. Um, when I was doing the series. It's fascinating. I mean, I've thought about it somewhat, but it, when you see it in front of you, um, like you present it, uh, the symbolism of chess is really extensive and deep. Um, and I like the way you bring it out. And, and I, for people who don't know, you're a sculptor as well. So when you say you made the chess set, you, you sculpted this uh, and it's cast, right? This is metal pieces, I assume. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly bronze. Um, with a couple of clay pieces. The looks of clay because they're um, furnaces. That's the most stable piece. So they're clay furnaces, and then the you know, the, the pawns are vials, like little alchemical vials, which my friend Cassidy in Australia um, blew. Like she, I, I don't know how to do glass glass blowing yet, so I'd like to learn. But um. I just did a rough sort of design of the idea and she you know, hand blew each one so they were a little bit different. And they're actually like hollow glass vials so they can contain red and white fluids as well on each side. Wow. Um, but yeah, the, the bronze figures were all um, cast on, you know, like sculpted in wax and then cast it in bronze and cut and made to make them white and um, red and black. Fascinating. You, I mean... The amount of talent that you kind of bring to your art is staggering in a lot of ways. I don't know if it feels that way when you're, you know, presenting or performing or creating, but um, from the outside, you know, it it very much seems like you are the prototypical Renaissance man, like. Uh, you know, the sculptor, the the writer, the artist, the performer, the magician, uh, and it goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really good at math. 
Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I do often say art is just sort of one thing, you know, like regardless of whether it's performance or sculpture or music or painting or whatever, it seems, yeah, I've tried to sort of sticking with one medium and I can do it for a while, but then I, I, it seems to always bounce off into other things and um, I find that really, uh, pretty great creatively actually because if I ever sort of, you know, get stuck with stagnant in a medium then um, switching to another one will sort of, you know, give it new life and then that will feed back to the earlier one or come back around to something else. Um, so it sort of keeps it, you know, always fresh and moving in that way. Yeah. I don't mean to digress, you know, from our intended subject too much, but I, I feel like um, you have a certain quality of being in the world that uh, facilitates your creativity and this sort of vast reservoir that you tap into I think is um, kind of you're, you're embodying it in a lot of ways by your, your entire lifestyle I just wonder if you might say a few words about that yeah I guess it's um, that's how I managed to do so much of it is that I don't sort of, you know, do anything else. I don't have a, like, a separate day job or something. I just sort of devote my life to, um, to art and magic, my art as magic. So, you know, I'm often quite obsessive about it, just being my own world with projects that I'm doing. Um, yeah, just spend as much as I, time as I can in that, in that kind of world. And it's, uh, I don't really have any, uh, any separation in my life um, you know, between like a job and the things I do uh, for enjoyment and the things I, you know, like it, it's all sort of, uh, I've, in recent years it's sort of come to a point where it seems um, all one thing in a way, you know, like uh, the travel and the, um, the art and the magic and the work and, and, and all of it, it's... Um, all sort of uh, integrated, which is great because I, yeah, I want to. Um, you know, I've kind of de- dedicated my life to to doing that, and I'm really glad that I'm able to sustain that. Yeah, I think those are <clears throat> wise words for anybody who's trying to take that leap. You know, it's just <laughs> there's no way to do it other than to do it. Yes, got to fully embrace it. Mm. Gotta live it. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it's become easier for me in recent years. I had some good opportunities, but um, when it was more difficult and challenging in the past, I still did it anyway. You know, no matter how, you know, it's often a struggle to um, make ends meet and get around and do these things. But I, I just persisted you know, because it's yeah, it's all I'm really interested in to do magic and art. Right. So I just kept at it until um, eventually um, having some success to make it uh, more easy and flowing to do so. Yes. Um, I want to talk about your residency. It's the Star and Snake because that is um, one of the main reasons you're here. Um, yeah, yeah, I wanted to talk about that too. Yeah, so please, um, for people who don't know, um, the Star and Snake is a wonderful, magical, and art center in New Hampshire, created by Natan and Kay. And um, well, I'll let you talk more about it. Yeah, well, I'm speaking from there right now. Um, just just drawing towards the end of my two-week residency here, um, twice a year. They have artist residencies that uh, haven't been going long. I think this is the third one. Um, where they just select a few artists. Um, anyone can apply. Um, you know, artists who have some kind of um, spiritual or magical aspect to what they're doing. And um, they come together in this amazing uh, old church that's sort of been re-consecrated as a, a temple of art and magic. Um, 
Yeah, um, that's been a really interesting experience. Um, yeah, it did. Uh, it 